Thank you very much. I try to be attractive uh, scientifically <laughs> after the lunch break. So by introducing you to Siegmund Feierabend. Um, Feierabend was one of the greatest publishers in the entire German lands, and he had a stellar career from the 1550s onwards. Soon after he began to work in Frankfurt, he formed collaborations with other printers and publishers to share the risk of the fickle book business. He was quick to sue anyone who dared to compete with him, and when he himself was sued for not settling his debts, um, Feierabend tried all available legal tricks to avoid paying his debts as long as he could. So the judgment from later scholars on Feierabend uh, have been relatively harsh, and here we have, we have some excerpts. So Feierabend was not a noble character, but he, possesses the ne he possessed the necessary ruthlessness to make rapid progress, so keep that in mind. For modern day scholars, such a difficult character is of course a lucky um, occurrence. The many hostile interactions between Feierabend and his suppliers, partners and clients left an abundance of evidence it allows us to peek behind the curtain of arguably the most prosperous book business in 16th century Frankfurt. Just to give you one example, one of the sources um, is a sales register compiled for the Frankfurt Fair in 1565. It's a truly magnificent source which enables us to trace Feierabend's sales practices, his publishing program, and his vast network. And here, you see the depth of his network, which included not only many parts in Germany, um, or many cities like the big book centers, Cologne, Augsburg, and Nuremberg, but the network also comprised clients from Venice, from Antwerp, and from Paris. And that was only at the beginning of Feierabend's career, so we can imagine that if we had a source from the later decades, the network would even be denser than this. But today, I'd like to focus on Feierabend's book catalogs. First, I'm going to make a few general remarks about book catalogs in Frankfurt, and then I'll focus on two catalogs in particular. Although Frankfurt was an extremely important commercial hub for the early modern book world, only relatively few book catalogs from this city are known. This lack of sources is, of course, connected to the general low survival rate of early modern documents. Ephemeral material, as you all know, such as catalogues produced as broadsides, booklets and manuscripts, stood a, stood a particular slim chance of being collected. But this is only a partial explanation why we have so few book catalogues from Frankfurt. If we look closer, the material that did survive seems to suggest that printers, publishers, and booksellers did not frequently um, compile book catalogues in the first place. It was simply not necessary, even for large publishing houses, to produce a new catalog for each single fair. Instead, they relied on old catalogues until they needed to be updated. Feierabend's first two catalogues that are known to us demonstrate this point very well. So let me give you first a short overview of the surviving catalogues for his firm. Currently we know of six catalogues, two from the 1570s, three from the 1580s, and one produced by his heirs in 1597. The first two items are actually derived from one and the same copy. Feierabend created it for the Imperial Book Commission, which obliged every printer, publisher, or bookseller advertising books in Frankfurt to hand in a copy. The printed text provides an overview of, war, of all 147 titles on offer at that particular spring fair. And that was the spring fair of 1576. Feierabend had then added by hand 40 new titles offered at the six consecutive events until the Spring Fair in 1579. And here you see a close-up of the um, bottom of the sheet. The items were listed with a separate headline indicating the particular fairs, so the Autumn Fair of 1576, the Spring Fair of 1577, and so on. This represented an average six to seven new books 
for every fare. So Feierabend did most likely not produce a printed copy for each of these individually mentioned fares. Instead, when he was prompted by the authorities to give an overview of his books, he just used an old printed copy and then updated it by hand. The last two catalogues that were produced by the Feierabend firm contain prices. This is on the one hand the catalogue from 1588, which was produced as a broadside, and on the other hand, the catalogue from 1597, which was produced as a booklet. And here you see its very first page. The eagle eye viewers among you will probably have spotted already that there is quite a difference in the design. So the first one um, has the prices as part of the printed text, whereas the later catalogue um, has the prices written by hand. This is arguably the first time such a form layout was used for a book catalog in the German lands. The publisher could just produce a number of copies of the form and then set different prices for different clients or even more importantly, adapt the prices to recent changes on the market. I'm very happy that I can show you the 1588 catalog today because it was commonly assumed that um, the only known copy was lost in the war. But it turned out that the catalog was just given to a different institution. And uh, this is a nice reminder to always keep looking for apparently lost documents. They may turn up, you never know, uh, in a different institution. And in that case, already being uh, digitized. The fact that we have two catalogues with prices prompts a number of research questions. One of the questions is why the catalogues were produced. So the catalog from 1588 is striking, as it differs quite decisively from the others. <clears throat> it only lists Latin law books. By the time the catalog was produced, this category was the most important section of firearms business. With the rise of Roman law in Germany and the increasing appointment of judicial specialists who had studied law in Italy or in France, Feierabend ventured increasingly into publishing the works of influential um, legal scholars from various countries. Thus, the Frankfurt publisher challenged the established print centers for Latin law books, namely Venice, Lyon, Basel, and Cologne, and often reprinted editions that had previously appeared there. So one example is a comprehensive work by Angelus de Ubaldis, the brother of the great jurist Baldus de Ubaldis. The book had appeared previously in 1551 in Lyon, and later Feyerabend published it in 1575. And we will return later to this book. The specialized catalog from 1588 was more than just another fair catalog. Um, it was a proud display of the sheer volume of the books that Feierabend had accumulated in this highly specialized area. There were few, if any, publishers at that time in 1588 who could have rivaled Feierabend's extraordinary collection of scholarly uh, legal works. But another more pressing issue was um, for Feierabend to publish a catalog in a legal dispute. So in 1588, he was once again fighting a publisher, um, a Frankfurt rival um, called Nicolaus Basset, whom he accused of producing illegal reprints of his law books. And given Feyerabend's tendency to escalate conflicts, this was not the first time uh, the two parties had fought. And in the course of the legal proceedings, Feyerabend may have thought that it's useful to have an overview of all his Latin law books to mark his territory. So Basset and other printers or publishers were discouraged from producing any of the mentioned titles um, in this catalog. But let us now turn to the content. So the 1588 catalog lists 93 books in two columns. And when I matched them to the bibliographical records we have in the USTC and the German National Bibliography VD16, I noticed that most of the books listed in the catalog were quite old, showing that legal law books could remain in stock for decades after their initial publication. 
Here's an overview of the publication date of the imprints. Only 23% of the books were produced either in the year that the catalogue was produced or uh, in the three years preceding it. Another 19 books were published between four and eight years um, before the catalogue. <clears throat> but the majority of the books, so 57%, um, have been produced many years earlier, so most, um, especially in the 1570s. Consequently, they were between 9 and 18 years old by the time Feierabend advertised them in 1588. It's also striking to see that 68% of the titles were then taken over in the later catalogue. So this shows that they, uh, the large majority of the Latin law books on offer in 1597 were really slow sellers. They were published decades before the catalogue um, was published. So now you may ask yourselves, did the age of the law books influence the prices? Just a short note, in Frankfurt at the time, we are calculating in Gulden with one Gulden consisting of 60 Kreuzer. And I've noted this at the next slide at the bottom. So we may expect that the older volumes were cheaper uh, than before, but it was not the case. Only 25% of the imprints decreased in price. So these were only 16 imprints that were cheaper in 1597 compared to 1588. The prices for the majority of the books remained stable, showing that despite their age, the books did not decline in value. This concerned 54%. Among them, for instance, was Bartholomé de Chazenes' um, Catalog um, Catalogus Gloriae Mundi, printed in 1586, um, which cost two gulden in both years, so in 1588 and in 1597, same price. What is even more interesting is to see that 13 imprints, so 21%, advertised in 1588 had increased in price by 1597. <clears throat> this increase was quite significant, with an average of 60%. In some cases, the increase was even as high as 87%. And here I've shown you the, the details from the books which increased in price over time. This increase is not explained easily. One may assume that it indicates that Feierabend's heirs sold bound copies of the 13 editions in question, but there is no indication whatsoever in the catalogue that suggests that these books were in fact bound or that they differed in any way from the other books um, on sale. It's much more likely that the prices increased because uh, the books were only available um, to a limited degree. Um, this becomes obvious with one book in particular, and now we return to Angelos de Ubaldis, his concilia nearly quadrupled in price, from 32 kreuzer to 120 kreuzer in 1597. At that time, Feierabend's heirs were presumably one of the few, if not the only, European publishers or booksellers who still sold copies of the book. And it was not a time-critical publication, so um, that would not have rendered the old copies obsolete. Uh, so the heirs could just advertise it and adapt the price accordingly. This prompts another question which we have um, also touched on in the preceding papers. Uh, what exactly determines the price of a book? As the project has already shown, and the papers especially this morning, um, printers, publishers and booksellers took a large variety of different factors into account before they set prices for their publications. And um, the language of the text, the size of the type, um, number of illustrations, quality of the paper. But there's another factor which may not be as obvious. And that is the price of previous editions, especially for books written by the same author or similar text genres or multi-volume works. And um, I found that in my data, and I talked to Joran, who I would like to thank um, for this, because he found something similar in Antwerp, and he called it the psychological factor, um, so that similar prices were set for the uh, works of the same author. 
for Feyerabend and his heirs, this psychological factor also played an important role. And it becomes evident already in the 1588 catalogue, in which Feyerabend advertised both Guido Papa's Concilia, printed in 1573, and his Decisiones, 1574. Whereas the Concilia comprised 129 sheets, the Decisiones consisted of nearly twice as many sheets. And despite this difference, both books were prized one golden. Similarly, when both editions were reprinted in the 1590s, they were again advertised for the same price, slightly higher that time because um, they were new editions. And that shows that the heirs later on also took the psychological factor into account. The pattern of pricing similar books in the same way also becomes obvious with the collection of court judgments. In the 1570, Feyerabend published three decisiones from the court in Turin, the Parisian Parliament, and the court in Lithuania. The letter is priced at one gulden and comprises some 130 printed sheets. However, the publication of Turin's court is twice as expensive with two gulden, um, although it contains only a few more sheets. And finally, the decisions of the Parisian Parliament is also priced at two gulden, and thus follows the pricing of the Italian item, yet among the three editions, it is by far the smallest publication with only 30 sheets. So this shows that the prices did not always depend on the size of the publication, but also on the price of similar editions. To conclude, the book catalogues from 1588 and 1597 offer us intriguing insights into Feyerabend's firm, the dissemination of its books, its pricing strategies, and book catalogues in general. Although their survival rate is low, even uh, we can safely assume that Feyerabend did not produce many printed uh, catalogues um, that have not survived. Instead, he used them as a way to advertise the long sellers of the firm and proudly displayed his production, like in 1588 when he produced the catalogue of the Latin law books. In this particular case, uh, Feyerabend even may have used the catalogue to dissuade other producers from reprinting any of the included titles. The catalogues from 1588 and 1597 tell us about different genres and their prices. Both catalogues confirm that law books remained relevant long after their initial publication date and that most of them lost little value uh, over time. So even, um, some even became a rarity and allowed the firearmed heirs to increase their prices. Feyerabend's ability to challenge the large, large print centers such as Lyon and Venice in their special areas, Latin law books, underlines how swift he was to seize opportunities. His shrewd business sense is reflected in his pricing strategy and in which the psychological factor played an important role. So as the sources show, um, law books became increasingly important for Feyerabend over the years. We may extend his biographer's judgments quoted at the beginning of this paper. Feyerabend was probably not a noble character, but he was a character well known in contemporary Europe for his elaborate legal publications. Thank you. <laughs>